Well, hello everyone. It is 11 a.m. here in Canada today. And I would like to welcome all of you who are joining us on today's webinar. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are coming from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in our 2016 webinar series, specifically on the topic of understanding behavior change to ensure success. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change, and I will be one of the moderators for today's webinar. Now I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about today's webinar which was developed with our collaborators at the Center for Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology, or COST. Successful delivery and adoption of technology for development is highly dependent on behavior change. However, changing behavior is difficult. Understanding what even constitutes successful behavior change is unlikely to be part of an engineering curriculum. So, we've invited Hans Mosler, Senior Research and Group Leader at EWAG, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, along with Valerie Cavan, Senior Advisor at Helvetas Swiss Intercorporation, to share their insights on evidence-based behavior change methods and provide some guidance on how to apply proven behavior change techniques to solution design in order to ensure success. They are joined by our guest moderator, Laura McDonald, who is a Knowledge and Research Coordinator at COST. I'd like to welcome all of our speakers and thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address visible on the slide that you are seeing. Now before we move to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of over one million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources such as this webinar, opportunities such as jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website, www.engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Now the webinar you're participating in today is part of our professional development offerings. Uh, the webinar series is a free, publicly available series of online seminars showcasing the best practices and thinking of development practitioners. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of our past presentations can be found on the E4C webinars page. The URL is listed. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. Hashtag E4C webinars. Um, E4C's upcoming webinars include a segment of our special mobile data collection series with the Development Impact Lab at UC Berkeley, where we'll be introducing a sample of six survey software tools um, with a demo on how to implement each tool. Uh, that one's not listed on this slide, but it will be on March 10th at 12 p.m. and will be featuring survey CTO. On March 24th, our topic will be Revolution is Nice in Humanitarian Aid Through Local Making, and we'll be joined by Naomi Ludman of Humanitarian Makers and Abby Bush of Field Ready. Check out the E4C Professional Development page for registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinars directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see first where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right hand of your screen, please type your location and I'll get us started. Today I'm in Waterloo, Canada. Oh, there we go. We have people coming in. Toronto, Detroit, Piscataway, New Jersey, 
California, the UK. Welcome, everybody. It's coming as a rush. Milan, India. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. If the chat window is not open on your screen, you can access it by clicking the chat icon on the top right corner of the screen. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go in the chat window. And feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any troubles. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is below the chat, to type your questions for the presenters. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the icon on the top right-hand corner. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page, and the URL is listed. Now, I see a lot more folks have answered the question of where they're joining us from today, and thank you so much for all of you from Grenada to Wisconsin to New York to Michigan and Accra and Vermont, all over. Thank you. It's so great to have you all here. I see some folks have entered their answers into the Q&A, but do keep in mind that that is dedicated to our questions for the presenters. Now, with all of this preamble, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our guest moderator, and I'm going to do a quick introduction of Laura McDonald, who is part of HOST and joined the research learning team in August 2015. As a knowledge and research coordinator, one of her key roles is managing the content on the newly launched household water treatment and safe storage knowledge base. Laura also engages with WASH researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to ensure that cost work addresses the needs of the sector and key findings. Um, welcome, Laura, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Iana. Hi, I'm Laura, as Iana introduced me, and I am a knowledge and research coordinator with COST. Just a brief introduction to COST itself. Uh, at COST, we focus exclusively on capacity building services, meaning we are not an implementing organization. And within capacity building, our area of expertise is on non-networked systems, so water, sanitation, and hygiene in households. Uh, since 2001, our services have largely been provided in person with some remote support. Uh, we provide training, but we found that training is often only the starting point, so ongoing tech support. We aim to equip our clients with the skills needed to improve their programs and ultimately address challenges on their own. And we also provide support through freely available education and training materials on our WASH resources website. And as a result of our in-person and remote support as well as our educational resources available online, we've helped over 3,000 organizations in 164 countries access our services and support continuously uh, 970 implementing clients. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Iana to introduce the speakers. Thank you. All right, so I, the first speaker today is Hans Mosler, who is an environmental and social scientist who has spent extensive years studying human behavior as it relates to health issues in developing countries. He's currently, as I mentioned, a senior researcher and group leader at EWAC. And Dr. Mosler's studies focus on how these behaviors factor into successful implementation of water and sanitation projects in order to reach better hygiene and health standards. His research topics and publications relating to safe water consumption, sanitation, hygiene, social dynamics, and behavioral guidelines have made him an expert in implementation of strategies for positive and lasting social change. We're very excited to have Dr. Mosler join us here today. He will also be joined by Valerie Caven of the Water and Infrastructure Team at Helvetas Swiss Inter Cooperation. She is in charge of the thematic uh, of the thematic of household water treatment, water quality, marketing, sanitation, hygiene, education, and behavior change. At the moment, she is leading the learning expedition of behavior change of Helvetas in close collaboration with UAG. She has experience of working a wash in more than 10 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Previously, she's worked at the UAC, as well as a project manager in the field of household water treatment and at the Swiss Development Cooperation in Nepal and Switzerland. We're very excited to have you both here, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mosler to take us through his insights. 
Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me, please? Perfectly. Oh, Perfectly. Clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thanks for the nice introduction, Jana. And uh, hello to everybody, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> the title of my presentation, as you see, is uh, Systematic Behavior Change Using the Runners Approach. And what uh, systematic behavior change means and what the Runners Approach is about, I will tell you in hello. the following. Um, let me begin with a statement that I think that you as engineers like. Implementers do a good job, yes? Mainly, okay. But what about the users? Um, you see here on the left a rainwater harvesting system container, but if you take a closer look at it, then you see that there's a direct connection between the latrine and this container. So it is really a misused system. Or here, um, very nice toilets, ventilated um, toilets. You see that with this um, uh, tube on the roof. About 50 toilets in the Bolivian Highlands, but no, not even one was ever used. Or here, oh, sorry for the disgusting picture, but it, it's very illustrative for toilets which are really badly used, so that nobody else can use them anymore. And here we have also toilets badly used, shared toilets in, in Kampala in Uganda. And the question is, how can we motivate people to clean their sanitation facilities regularly? especially when they are shared. Promoting solar water disinfection, and, but you have only limited or partial or even no uptake. Question arises, how can we motivate people to apply a correct water treatment method? It has not to be sodas, it can be chlorination or boiling or whatsoever. Then, Introducing hand washing, but there might be no compliance, as for example here in, uh, in Haiti. Question arises, how can we motivate people to perform more hand washing at key times? How to introduce behavior changes, then the question. You implement hardware, for example a safe water kiosk, um, and you expect that there is a lot of consumption of safe water, but it doesn't happen because there is a person in between, and the person, and, and therefore the statement is, behavior change starts in the head of the people. How to introduce behavior change? You install the hardware, and some people might use, for example, a safe water kiosk. Other persons, like person B, here not. So they are somehow different in their mindsets. And we call them, they are different in behavioral factors. What are behavioral factors? Behavioral factors um, are, for example, thoughts, beliefs, feelings, perceptions, like knowledge or um, what do you think about the water, if you, if you would drink it, what would be the taste, or how do you perceive social pressure to perform the behavior, and so on. So, for, together with the hardware, we need some kind of software, yes? Software is a promotion technique, is, is a behavior change technique, with which we try to change these behavioral factors. You see, factor A minus C minus, and then factor A and factor C uh, plus. And it is more complicated. We need, we always will have doers and non-doers. People who drink safe water and people who don't drink safe water. And they are different. Different, here indicated by factor C, maybe they have not enough, enough knowledge, or they, they uh, don't like the water, or yeah. 
And so the first step is that we identify these behavioral factors. Then we want to measure and calculate the differences between the doers and non-doers. And select behavior change techniques accordingly. Accordingly means that we, we want to select the behavior change strategies accordingly to the factors we have to change. Here indicated by factor C minus and factor B minus. Factor A we don't have to change because it's the same for doers and non-doers. Then we design and implement the software and at the end, not at the end, beginning and the end, we have to monitor change, but not only in behavior, but also in behavioral factors. We want to know whether we were able to change C minus and B minus to C and B. So we have, and this is now the systematic, the rather systematic behavior change approach. It comprises four steps, as already introduced. The first step is to identify the behavioral factors. Then we have the tools. For tools, we have qualitative interviews and the RANAF model, which, we, which I will present in a minute. And we have output. We know then which behavioral factors we have to test. Then we measure and determine the behavioral factors, do this doer, non-doer analysis. Then we know which behavioral factors we have to change. Next step is that we have to select the behavior change techniques and design behavior change strategies. Therefore, we have a RANAS catalog of these behavior change strategies, and then we know which behavior change techniques to apply. And the fourth step is that we implement and evaluate the behavior change strategies. Therefore, we use a uh, before-after control trial, and then we know which behavior change strategies is the best and uh, uh, the best to apply, and then we know the effective behavior change. Okay, let me go into a field situation. Imagine that you are standing uh, right behind this desk in front of the audience, and you are, I think, you are promoting chlorination. What do you say? Before you say anything, you have to think about what these people in front of you think. Yeah? Might be, for example, am I at risk and why? Or how to do it? Or what does it cost? What does it bring to me if I apply it? Do I like it? Do I like fluorinated water? What will others say? This woman in, in the back is talking to others, so it might be interesting or uh, important for her what others, others will say if she applies chlorination. Can I do it? Am I able to do it? And these, uh, and how to manage it? Yes. Um, it's a bit difficult to, to manage the slides. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. These these thoughts can be arranged into four fa blocks of factors. The risk factors, the attitude factors, the norm factors, ability factors, and self-regulation factors. And these come, these, these blocks of factors do not come out of nothing, but they are based on environmental and health psychology experience of, let's say, more than 50 years of of, um, of trials and theories and so on. Oh, that's not the way I wanted to present it, but I try to, to deal with that. Huh? Um, on the left, in the green, you have the behaviors. You have behavior A and behavior B. So you have always an alternative to the intended behavior. Drinking, you want to, to, to promote drinking disinfected water, but there's also a behavior drinking raw water. And the taste might be different, so both tastes play a role. In the midst, you have these factor blocks. <clears throat> risk factors are the person's understanding and awareness of the health risk. The attitude factors are a person's positive or negative stance to water, to water behavior. And the norm factors 
are concerned to the perceived social pressure towards a behavior. The ability factors are about the confidence in the person's ability to practice a behavior. And the self-regulation factors, very important, the person's attempt to plan and self-monitor a behavior and to manage conflicting goals and distracting cues. On the left side, you find the behavior change techniques, which each of these block of behavior change techniques, we know that we can change these behavioral factors. And on the bottom, you have the context, the social context, socio-cultural context, for example, the physical context, how far is, um, is the well, for example, and the personal context. How wealthy is the person or, um, yeah. So we have identified uh, the, the potential behavioral factors. Now we know which behavioral factors we have to test and we come to the next step to measure and determine the behavioral factors. We do that with a questionnaire, with a standardized questionnaire. You see, I have marked the norm, for example, in, in the norm slot, the perceived behavior of others. We ask here, what do you think? How many people of your relatives practice open defecation or use a latrine? Here, the questionnaire is about open defecation. Or if you go a step um, up, feelings, how pleasant or unpleasant is it for you to defecate in the open or use a latrine? Then, when we have measured these factors, we do this dual non dual analysis. <laughs> Here you see person um, A to W score in health knowledge and score in others' behavior. And person B to Z also score in health knowledge and score in others' behavior. Something is missing here. On the left side, we have the doers, and on the right side, we have the non doers. Maybe they appear? No, they don't appear. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so we have to compare the mean score in knowledge for the doers and the non-doers, and we see that there is not a big difference. But for the score in perceived others' behavior, there's a big difference. So we know, now we know that we have not to tackle health knowledge, but we have to tackle the perceived others' behavior. Okay, we have selected the behavioral factors. Um, we have selected the behavioral factors. Now we need to know, now we need to select the behavior change techniques. How do we do that? We have a catalog, we have a RANAS catalog of behavior change techniques. This is also coming out of health psychology and environmental psychology. The first of these I have highlighted, you know it quite well. This is when you want to change health knowledge, you do it by presenting facts. You present information about the circumstances and possibilities of contracting a disease and about the relationship between the behavior and the disease. Second, I have highlighted when you want to change beliefs about costs and benefits, then you do an inform about and assess costs and benefits. Provide information about costs and benefits of a behavior or of the mission of a behavior and conduct a cost benefits analysis. I will give you an example in a few minutes. So other behavior change techniques which you might not so know so well are um, if you want to tackle barrier planning, then prompt coping with barriers, ask participants to identify barriers to behavior change and plan solutions to those barriers. If remembering is the problem, then use memory aids and environmental prompts. So for each of these behavioral factors, we have behavior change techniques with which we can change these behavioral factors. I have not displayed all, but uh, the total number is 36 behavior change techniques.
I want to, 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 to emphasize that communication channels and behavior change techniques are not the same. Communication channels are the mode of delivery of behavior change techniques. I know that when we ask um, um, development organizations, oh, what, what kind of uh, promotion activities did you do? And then they say, oh, we had um, community meetings. And then I say, yes, but, but was, what was the contents of the community meetings? So the, the contents is the behavior change techniques. For example, if you see here at the, at the left, household visits by promoters, then what does the promoter say? And that's exactly the uh, behavior change techniques. But the promoter himself, or uh, working with promoters, is not a behavior change technique. It's a it is a communication channel. Just to make this distinction clear. Um, let me give you an example. It's about fluoride removing community filters in Ethiopia. Um, you might know that excessive fluoride consumption of uh, excessive consumption of fluoride um, is is very bad for the for the body. And my colleagues here from AIWAC, the engineers, have installed these um, community filters, and we did the social analysis. Um, for that. So here is the doer-non-doer -doer analysis. Here it means differences in mean of 100% users and less than 100% users because 100% is necessary, otherwise you will fall sick. And you see here the difference between the users and the 100% the users and the um, not 100% users is indicated by this um, green bar, oh, it's not in the right place, but you see that costs, of course, costs are the most important behavioral factor here. It is, the costs are, and that's not surprising because this water costs a double than the, uh, the normal water. So, how did we implement this behavior change techniques, inform about and assess costs and benefits. We did a persuasion of perceived costs. The first was that we said higher price is better quality. And this we did with examples from the daily life of the people. Then we did a personal, or the promoter did a personal water budget. The promoter calculates the water consumption of the family for food for cooking and for drinking, and how much water they then need from the community filter and how much does it cost at the end. And that's not so much if you calculate through. So, and the, but the NGO wanted that we um, perform also a persuasion on children's vulnerability so we asked the, about the current water source that they used and how contaminated it is. Then we gave a personal risk information for all children and then asked, what can you do? I have to go back up, yeah, that's possible. And you see that vulnerability and severity, also perceived vulnerability and perceived severity are the same for the doers and non-doers. And we would not have done any intervention on these. But the NGO wanted to intervene on that, and okay, we did it. I'll present you the results in a minute. So now we come to the next, to the last step, implement and evaluate the behavior change strategies. You, uh, we do that with the before-after control trial. How does it look like? Here you see, um, evaluating the behavior. It's a percentage of safe water consumption of total water consumption. And the first value, are you see person A to S got the intervention, person B to T did not get the intervention. And the first value is before the intervention and the second value is after the intervention. So person A uh, used 40% of uh, safe water of the total water consumption before the intervention and 80% after the intervention. So the improvement was 
40% more. And you do that, that for the persons who got the interventions and for the persons who did not get the interventions. And you see that there is a, a big difference in mean increase. Mean increase means sum of differences uh, divided by the number of persons. And then you can say, okay, the behavior really changed differently for those who got the interventions compared to those who did not get the intervention. But we do the same. Oops. Hello? It's not running. Ah, yes, now. Um, but we do the same for the behavioral factors. Here's the example with the other's approval. Yes? Do you think that overall people who are important to you rather approve or disapprove that you drink safe water? Yeah? And you have a scale from one to five. And you see that person A, before the intervention, had the value two, and after the intervention, the value five, and, and this is an improvement of three. If you calculate the mean change, like we did it for the water consumption, then you see that there's a big difference between uh, the people who got the intervention and the people who did not. So we can say that the factor aimed at here perceived others' approval really changed. And we were successful uh, with regard to this. And here you see, for the example of the Ethiopia community field filter, um, uh, light blue is before and dark blue is after the intervention. And you see here we have the mean value for the um, intervention group and for the control group. And this is about perceived costs. So with our intervention in the Ethiopian example, we were able to change the perceived cost, to decrease the perceived cost. And simultaneously, the consumption of safe water, of filtered water, increased. And it is important to point that we did not change the real prices. We changed the perceived price, nothing more. I'm, I don't hear anything from you. Can, can we give anybody a, a feedback whether you hear me or not? Yes, we can hear you, Hans. Continue. Thanks. Okay, I'm fine because I, I don't hear anything. It's a bit strange for presenting. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, then I come back to the, to the questions posed at the beginning of the presentation. How can we motivate people to clean the sanitation facilities regularly? Cleaning of shared toilets in Kampala in Uganda you see, by implementing group discussions and additionally commitment, cleanliness of shared toilets could be improved by factor three. How to motivate people to apply a correct water treatment method? Here's solar water disinfection. Even 18 months after the intervention, 75 to 85% of the households have observed sodis bottles in the sun. This was in peri-urban Harare in Zimbabwe. Next slide. Yes. And how to motivate people to perform more hand washing at tea times. Here we induced uh, tippy-tap construction and public commitment in the Borina zone in Ethiopia. And uh, it was quite successful because around 95% of the intervention households were successfully motivated to construct the tippy tap, they did it by themselves. And two to three months after the intervention termination, in 50 to 80 percent of the households, these tippy taps were still in function. More information you can have on our website. We have compiled some intervention fact sheets about the success in different uh, projects. And if you want to know more about the approach, then uh, um, have a look at our methodological fact sheet. These are two pages, so you, you get an impression very, very short. Take home message of this webinar, understanding behavior change to ensure success. 
Systematic behavior change enables you the, to the exact determination of the behavioral factors to be changed, and this brings you to understand behavior change really. Then you do the focus selection of corresponding uh, behavior change techniques, and then you prove the record of success. You ensure the success. So understand and ensure. Um, how can you now make use of the RANA systematic behavior change approach? I would say check first your behavior change activities on the background of this approach. The first question is, which behavioral factors are you targeting? Only health or more? Health knowledge. And then, which behavior change techniques are you applying with which purpose? Look at your behavior change techniques and then um, think about what, what, what do you really want to change with them. Or second step would be revise your CAP survey if you have one or build all your questions on according to the RANAS model. We have a, a, um, a ready to go questionnaire. You have to adapt it to your local situation, of course. Um, but look at your surveys and improve them. And at the end, measure before and after and compare to a control group so that you are sure that you have had success, not only in behavior, but only in changing the behavioral factors. And if you want to learn more about the RANAS approach, we have a practice-oriented EAWA course on the topic uh, in, on March 15 to 16, and you can participate in the course via internet if you want, please join. Okay, thank you for listening. I hand over to Valerie. Thanks so much, Hans. Uh, and March 15th to 16th is good timing, given that World Water Day is on March 16th. Um, okay. <laughs> before handing over to Valerie, I just wanted to ask you one question. And thanks to those who have submitted questions so far. Just a reminder to submit your questions in the Q&A section. So this question is from Rachel. Um, how long was water consumption measured after the intervention? For example, was it six months after, two years after? And how do you know if your intervention passes the test of time once you leave? Mm -hmm. I, shall I shall answer directly, yes? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. um, uh, we, have, we have tested it six months and um, 12 months after the last intervention in the case of authentic safe water in Bangladesh. Um, directly after the intervention, we had 65% uh, of new users of authentic free water wells, and this decreased to 45%. So there's still a large percentage of new users which had access before to authentic safe wells, um, but I would say you have to 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 continue to 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 with your promotion activities for up to a year that it is really it that it really becomes a habit and when it is a habit then they will do it automatically not everybody but many people so um, we are quite successful also in the long term as I have presented for the solar water disinfection. Uh, um, but I think you cannot expect that people do it life for the lifetime. Okay. okay. Thanks so much. And I'll ask you to mute for sound quality. And now okay. I will yes. turn to Valerie. Valerie, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Good, good morning or good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Valerie Kava from Helvetia Swiss Intercorporation. Uh, I hope you hear me now. Um, I will um, show you or present you our learning expedition on behavior change, uh, which we started uh, some uh, almost more than a year before. So first, before I, I, I start to, to talk about our learning expedition, I just want to, to give some 
Very few information on, on Helveta Swiss Intercooperation. Um, we are um, a Swiss development NGO which exists uh, since 60 years, uh, working in almost 30 countries with 1,200 staff, which are mainly national national staff uh, in the countries, and uh, we also have a good 14 years of of wash experience and uh, still trying to be innovative and trying out new things. That's just in short uh, what we are doing. If you want to know more about Helvetas, then you can uh, look at our webpage. So now coming to our learning expedition, I hope you you are not too much confused after the presentation of Hans Mosler because I was when I first heard about the runners um, methodology, but uh, it, I kept it in my mind when we we encountered this, all these problems in our WASH projects. So the background of this of the start of the uh, learning expedition was that the uh, water quality of point of use was a challenge. We uh, always do some uh, external impact study of our project, and we did one um, in collaboration with the ETH in University of, in Switzerland about our project in Benin, and the, the result of the study was really improved. We had improved water quality through, through our uh, new technology, but there was no change at all of the water quality at the household level. Again, we also did another study in Nepal with very similar results. 91% um, of the sample at the household level were contaminated. So this was a little bit uh, a shock, and we thought um, we, not, we just cannot just continue to uh, introduce new technology for water supply, and at the end, the effect is vanished through recontamination or the bad management and bad hygiene at the household level. So, um, in most of our WASH projects, uh, this behavior change is really a challenge. I think it's not always a, not only a challenge in WASH projects, but in many others like food security and nutrition. And uh, our classical approach did not really uh, give the expected results. So we we were really thinking we really have to to switch from hygiene promotion to behavior change, but then the, the big question was how how we can do it. So we started to do this learning expedition on behavior change, we call it like that. It's, a, it's an expedition, we don't know where it will end up and also uh, how long it will go, uh, but we, we started this collaboration with the AIRVAC and the, the main objective of this learning expedition is, uh, as you have seen, uh, the RANAS model is a relatively scientific behavior change approach, and we wanted to see how we can adapt and make it more applicable and less cost intensive for our project. So the main question was how far we can simplify and not losing the scientific essence, how much support do we need for our local team to implement such a new approach, and also a little bit what is the cost-benefit ratio introducing this systematic behavior change approach. For that, we started some pilots in Haiti, Mali, Benin, and Mozambique, where we wanted to, to find out how what's how we can implement this kind of thing. Really in the field with our local teams with not much external resources. So uh, I very shortly just give you a, a, a small idea about the project, what kind of project we have where we did implement this thing. Uh, we had a new project uh, named Sikura in Mali, um, not a very big Pro project trying improving access to water and hygiene practice. Uh, um, small one, but uh, with the aim to experiment with new approaches. 
Then we have an, another project, the one mentioned in Benin, where we already work since several years, improving uh, uh, water and hygiene in school, health center, and on the community level, with the long-lasting experience of transforming well, a new developed approach in Benin. And then we have another project in Mozambique, which is a big project, uh, mainly with the emphasis on, on water governance issue, but having hygiene and, and sanitation also uh, as a focus. So first, uh, we got some trainings from AirVac, and then we said, okay, it sounds logic and we have to, to get to know more about behavior change and how it works in our head, in our black box. But uh, listening to it, we, we thought we, we have to, to simplify the approach because it's for our local staff, uh, it's far too complicated. So we, the first thing we did, we simplified the terminology because we thought it was difficult to understand all these scientific factors. I'm also not a psycholog uh, psychologist, so it's also far away from my, from my uh, common language. Then we also simplified and reduced the questionnaire because uh, doing uh, surveys is for us in, in our more, sometimes rather smaller project, it's, 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 a, it's a big issue. Then uh, we also decided to, to reduce the, the sample size to the, the, I think, to, to the minimum which was scientifically or reasonable for, for the methodology. And also the analysis of the data, we decided to do it only um, with Excel, only calculating mean and not entering into more statistical analysis. And we started uh, in Mali, then in Benin and Mozambique, and during the implementation, we always adapted and simplified again the, the methodology. So just to, to explain how we proceeded, we did some capacity building of the team uh, on, on, on runners or on this psychological concept. We choose the behavior and the, the definition of the environmental factors. In Benin, we choose water, transport and storage and hand washing. We elaborated the questionnaire and did some interviews with the household, did the data analysis, defined the promotion campaign and uh, launched the intervention. And we'll do an evaluation. So now I'm, I'm showing you the, <laughs> some of the results, so be not uh, af afraid about the presentation. It's, it's just roughly there also, uh, there, and there were quite some information. These are the results on hand washing. Just to, to show you uh, where we identified the biggest difference between the doers and the non-doers. So uh, how you see, it was mainly uh, in the norm factors and also in the self-regulation factors. So um, for Benin, it's the, the point was really what others are thinking about the behavior, how others are motivating you, and, um, and what others are doing. Uh, on the self-regulation factors, it was mainly the the forgetting of, of hand washing. So, and what is also typical or um, became sometimes also obvious that all the, the factor about the risk were not the, 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 the relevant factor. And in, in the, and before we were mostly communicating on, on risk factor, on, on health issues. Then, uh, based on this information, uh, we discussed in the team, so how we, we could tackle these other factors or how we could adapt our intervention to tackle these, these factors. 
So um, here is is just a short overview on on what we change. Um, we define an activities to to tackle the factors of the other's behavior. So we we the intervention should inform about the behaviors of others, and for this we use the. Um, um, uh, theater where we were, uh, well, what we already did before. We we did some theater on hygiene and all that kind of thing. But what was new? It was the content of the theater. We did not uh, focus the me message of the theater on all this health issue and 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 and, and risk, but we were. Um, Targeting the issue of, of norms, what others are doing, the pressuring the, the pressure in the family when the majority is is washing hands in the situation of of um, of the new wife entering this new family. Uh, what we also did um, to um, support. The other approvals is, was to inform the others about the approval of the others, and, and for that we we try to identify an influential person in the household and in the village who was ready to to take a picture uh, of him doing the hand washing and then hang up the the picture in the family and in the village. Uh, regarding the forget uh, the, the self regulation factor, we. We produced some prompts where we put at the place of hand washing to remember people of doing the behavior. Um, if I going now to, to Mozambique, here we we looked at the, the latrine news, and again, um, if you look at the, at the result, the main factor or the main difference was also on on the norm factors and the self regulation factors. Um, what we also did in, in, in the survey, we also collect a lot of information, um, also on the information of Latvian con, uh, condition, and here we also identified that there was a big difference on the, the Latvian condition between the users and non-users. So it was also kind of a, an, uh, a conclusion that the, the condition of the Latvian also has an influence and that we also have to consider that in our intervention. So uh, on the norm factors, we uh, we define an intervention where we want to to inform the other people of the village about the improved latrine and the nice latrine. It was kind of trying to visualize the the household which has already a good latrine in 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 putting a, a sign on their house so that people see who has a good latrine and increasing the 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 pressure, the social pressure, and then um, for the self-regulation factor, we stressed out that we we want to. This was the commitment which was important, and there we uh, organized community meeting where there was a public commitment uh, combined also with the motivation if people will uh, improve their latrine. Um, um, so that people see who is committed to improve the latrine and, and use it also appropriately. Um, in Mozambique, and this is also a uh, lesson learned, was a challenge that we, this project is really in close coordination with the local authority because it's a governance project. Um, and this is also, uh, we uh, uh, tried to integrate them. Uh, but it was a, a little bit of a challenge uh, introducing this concept, but then they, they, bought, they bought it, they were uh, motivated to, to change a little bit the um, intervention strategy. But then for the, for the implementation, as they decide in which commune they, they will intervene, it was not, um, we, uh, there was then a little bit a mismatch of, of the intervention area where they, they were applying the, um, the new 
uh, approach and, and where we did the survey. So we will have some challenge in, in the evaluation. <laughs> so other challenge uh, applying this method and also based on the I think it's it's wash teams are of technical person and I think it's not only uh, only regarding um, um, watch project often if you introduce new technology you have a lot of technical market people and psychology is really far away from from their uh, agenda and it's hard to understand it's the same if I would ask a psychologist to build me a latrine I was also not he will also not feel very comfortable then the, the question of development um, there are very specific questions uh, and I think in the very first time there is some support needed uh, we try to to reduce and and simplify the question as much as we can uh, but when you start you really have to, to spend some time then uh, data collection analysis and interpretation I think this is a thing which is relevant for all uh, surveys but um, it uh, needs some some skills and you have to plan enough um, time uh, what we have seen in Mozambique we did the data collection uh, uh, with mobile mobile phones and and this was really more easier and much motivating more motivating for for the people then I think what for me is the biggest challenge after you have done all this work this data collection analysis then um, it was really the thing that people know okay now we have to to address norms and self regulation factors but then when we when we they started to develop intervention they fall back into their old behavior so they this this we started to to present hygiene message health message so it really has to to make click in the heads that to change the content of intervention you usually do. Another thing, it's, it's a little bit of time factor, it takes time, um, it's a whole process if you do the evaluation afterwards, the intervention, and so uh, it's, it's very important that you have a focal point person and that you don't hurry too much. Uh, regarding the, the lessons learned is really that you, you need an open-minded team who is ready to, to enter into a new field uh, and also the su supportive management. Uh, what was very important is this exchange between research partner, local partners, the head office to create a little bit of win situation. I think research is Institute can learn from from us as well as we from them. Then uh, uh, you also have to sensitize and build up the capacity in your organization introducing this new technology, and it's it's a continuous learning. I think we are still doing a kind of try and error thing in simplifying and adapting to to field conditions. The other um, results are not always that uh, very quickly visible in, in regard to behavior change. It's kind of a risk-taking uh, uh, exercise, so you have to be open and to try an error and to have this longer time perspective. And and this implies also kind of behavior change in, in, in the organization, uh, explaining it to donor, to, to project team. What is also an issue which was also clearly coming out is that uh, we always want to change too many behaviors. I think we want that they, they use a new household treatment technology, that they change their hygiene behavior, that they use the latrine, that they pay for 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 water. So it's it's to be a little bit less ambitious. And and uh, 
I think uh, what we are doing, because there was some question uh, how much you have already implemented and how uh, realistic and affordable is, is this. Um, we have foreseen an evaluation in Mali and Mozambique to, to really see how the intervention was functioning. Um, regarding to the cost, I think all this baseline and analyzing the data, this this was is a cost factor, but then for the intervention fact, for the intervention, you usually do this intervention already. You you have some sensitization work, but it's more a kind of what is the content and to who you address it and how you you address it. Uh, what we are now doing is to develop a two-option approach for projects. One is which is uh, really more kind of short and dirty and quick and cheap version uh, for projects who which do not have too much resources and not a lot of uh, capacity. We um, we just decided one or two days ago that uh, we will. Uh, somehow make an experiment, uh, an experiment uh, during our regional watch um, meeting in May in West Africa, where we want to apply a really very short um, kind of runner's approach in analyzing why people are not ready to pay for water, to have a clear picture in, in the group with the different projects in, in, in a four or five days time. And based on that, we will have some further evidence how this is functioning. And then uh, the other option is really to for projects which have a uh, more capacity and more budget to have kind of full-fledged simplified runoff approach with really practical guidelines. Then what we also try is to, to pilot kind of distant support and training for, for the short options. We, we started uh, this in Pakistan, uh, trying to improve their uh, CAP study and introducing this kind of survey, and also in Bolivia on another topic, not on, on more on waste collection and not on wash. I think uh, we, based on, on the results we will have, we we want also to taste the, the transferability to to other issues of behavior change. Uh, it could be. Um, on nutrition, food security, uh, things uh, where um, behavior change is also very much linked to to uh, to the successful approach. So um, this is a bit in a nutshell our experience we we made, and we are still learning and, and trying out. Great, thanks so much, Valerie. Um, that was an excellent presentation. I know that some of you have to leave. It's now just past 10 o'clock. Um, we will go for 10 more minutes to about 10.15 to allow for a couple of questions answered. And as a reminder, this recording will be made available on the Engineering for Change website. So, Valerie, one question that came up was, Apologies. Uh, specific to children, so Michael asked, how does compliance with desired new behaviors vary based on the age of the user? And do children follow the desired behaviors on their own, or do they require supervision? So in the projects that Helvetas has been involved in, what have you seen there with respect to children? Okay. Um, I think... Uh I think we did not focus on on, on, chi on children yet, um, okay. but when we were talking about uh, behavior ch change on, on hygiene or, or using safe water, I think you always try to identify who, which person or which target group has the, the biggest leverage effect on 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 this, and then you try to orient. The, the study on, on that person because 
this person will have the, the biggest influence and, and can be motivated to, to change the, the behavior Excellent. of others. Okay. And Hans, there have been a couple of questions regarding perceived price. So the first is, could you explain a little what the difference is between perceived and actual cost? And then secondly, how do you change perceived price? Hans, can you unmute yourself? There yes, you go. Now, now I'm here. I'm, okay, yes. Um, well, the perceived price is the price in the head of the people. And I can illustrate it very easily. If you have uh, a lot of money in your pocket, uh, um, $10 will be less than if you have only a small pocket. That's an easy explanation. Um, we we change the perceived price by by um, make, making the the people aware that it is not that much that they have to spend additionally for uh, purchasing um, filtered water from the community filter. This was I think this was the the central uh, the, the central point, and the other. Um, technique was that um, we we said okay higher price is higher quality and they, this is what something they know yeah? but there is an intervention fact sheet where you can uh, look at our homepage and there it is described in, in more detail great thank you so another question um, for Valerie, was you talked about having an adaptive process as you piloted um, this approach. Can you mention any specific examples of changes that you made as you adapted the approach in the pilot? Valerie, can you unmute yourself? There you are. Oh. Okay, um, what we we tried uh, it's I think the how Eva was doing the questionnaire it was a really um, almost uh, twenty thirty page questionnaire which was very scientific and um, now for we reduce it to to some some pages and also simplified the question in the way they were asked. Uh, we did it that we really let the local partner participate in the elaboration of the questions and they were immediately saying, oh, this is a crazy question, I don't under, no, un, uh, understand, or this it will be difficult to translate. And this had already helped to, to simplify the whole thing. Um, what we also, uh, what we also will do on the evaluation is that we, to, to reduce also the question, that we then focus mainly on the factors which were the one we, we tackled most. And we will not again ask question on risk because this was somehow not so relevant. Um, I don't know what Airbag is thinking about, but we, we are in, in discussion uh, on that. And and also reducing the the sample size and the how you analyze the data was was one thing. Um, this this other option we want to develop is more to to use the model uh, with the different factors to analyze what is already done and where we can. Uh, focus more on uh, which factor we did neglect and where we can focus more uh, without doing a, a really big study before. Excellent. Thanks, Valerie. Hans, a question from Aaron Tanner. Um, have you seen any specific criteria that are frequently important or well-performing? Or have you seen any trends when using the RANAS model? Or is the take home really that there are no trends and each population has to be studied? Yes, 
um, there are trends, um, but I yeah there are trends. Oh, first the trends. Um, social pressure is always important, and also the the attitudes, cost benefit um, um, thoughts of of the people are also very important. However, um, we find that it in in some populations for for some behaviors. Also, um, health knowledge might be important or vulnerability or severity. So if you want to, you, I, I would say if you, you can't do it without any, any survey or you, you apply a short, a small survey or, or, or a big one, um, but I recommend that you, that you do a survey. Who wants to, to get medicine with, without a good diagnosis from the doctor? Mm. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question, perhaps for you both, because Helvetas has been involved in adapting the RANAS model for um, use by implementers, and then, of course, Hans, you've been the developer of the RANAS model. Um, Myra, what would it take to adapt run us for an emergency context. I'll start with Valerie, your insight on what further changes you might make uh, to the run us for an emergency context, and then I'll let Hans also contribute. Okay, so I think honestly, I don't see run us, uh, I don't see run us Do you, do you hear me now? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yeah. Uh, I don't see RANAS in an emergency context uh, because it's, it takes some time. You, you, yeah, you need some time to develop, and, it's, and I think this behavior change things is, is a long time. It's a more a long-term process. Um, it can help afterwards or based on, on if you have already some information on the situation, then you might be better positioned to design intervention when it's an emergency, but I don't see it too much in, yeah, in that context. Thank you. And Hans? No, I have a, I have ideas about that. <laughs> I am in contradiction to to Valerie. Um, no, no, we, we, I think we can reduce uh, the the relevant questions in the survey to ten minutes, and add some spot checks observations, some some behavioral observations, and and uh, do a kind of triangulation, uh, getting out of these data the the right interventions in in a in a short time. We have no experience with that, but I have ideas about how to do it, and I would like to collect evidence on that. That's it. All right. So, Myra, you should connect with Hans on that after the webinar, for sure. Um, and just one quick question for each of you. There were a couple of questions regarding resources that you mentioned. Valerie, a question from Lee Boudreau is, when do you anticipate the draft manual being completed, and will it be public for other organizations who are looking to practically implement RANAS? Yes, I think we can share it. I think first, uh, Hans, they have <laughs> worked on, on, on their guidelines mm -hmm. and, and they will, I think, Hans, you have to correct me, publish them somewhere in, in, in summer. And I, I am waiting the, the, the evaluation of, uh, of our project to, to put also more insights on that. And my guidelines are more on, on the practical, how to do step by step, and, and uh, the guidelines of Hans are really the, I think, the, the, the basic and the, 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 the big framework. Okay. And Hans from Bradford, uh, he asked, Bradford asked, where can we find the sample RANAS questionnaire that you mentioned in your presentation? Ah, um, look at the methodological fact sheets on our homepage. Okay, on AVOG's homepage? Yeah. Okay, excellent. On our group's homepage, yeah. 
Okay. So, um, so with that, I'd like to thank both Hans and Valerie again for being the panelists and taking our questions. It's been a great um, set of presentations, and I'm glad that we took some time to ask questions afterwards. This recording will be available on the Engineering for Change website. Um, again, thank you for attending. As Iana mentioned at the beginning, you can get a certificate for your professional development uh, using this information that's available here. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to email at webinars at engineeringforchange.org or you can also email cost at support at cost.org. And of course, uh, we hope that you'll join us for future webinars. So thanks to everyone and have a good day.